Good evening. Good evening. We have a lonely fan here down here. This fan would love to be of service to somebody. If you're feeling a little bit hot tonight, you're more than welcome to come a bit further forward and enjoy the benefit of the fan, because at the moment it's just not making much of a difference at all. But anyway, on a more serious note, we come into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight to meet with him and to uh, encourage ourselves about the joy and the glory that lies before us. Our call to worship this evening comes from Psalm 84. I sometimes read this at funerals, especially at Christian funerals. Uh, and this should really be at the heart of the longing of every Christian. This was uh, uh, written by the sons of Korah. It's almost certainly one of the songs that the pilgrims sang as they went on pilgrimage three times a year at least to go up to Jerusalem to offer the sacrifices and attend the feasts. And that was a long, arduous journey. You think it's a hot day today? Well, can you imagine what it would be like being, uh, being 35 degrees, much, much hotter than this, uh, out in the open sun, and you've got to carry your own water with you, and it's hard, hard work sometimes of the year. And so this was the song that they would sing to encourage themselves as they headed towards that uh, physical temple. And this is really should be capturing what we should be thinking about, that glorious heavenly temple that lies before us. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of God. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. For even a sparrow has found a home and a swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young a place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, they are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca. They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. So there you've got that valley of Baca. Uh, you could almost translate that as the Valley of Tears. There are difficult times in this life, but they're also along the way that of, of our pilgrimage. There are those places of springs, the autumn rains cover it with pools, those places of glorious refreshing where God renews our love and our commitment towards him. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O oh Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. So let's praise our, uh, the, our glorious King of Heaven in this, our opening hymn. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Thank you. 
praise and worship. Lord, it is a good thing to praise you, to praise the King of Heaven, to know, dear Lord, that you inhabit heaven forever and you have invited us there by your grace and mercy, dear Lord. But Lord, in this life, we long for foretastes of that glory to come. Send down your Holy Spirit, dear Lord. May he lift our hearts into heaven. May we be seated in heavenly places alongside Jesus. And may we there be willing to cast down our crowns in love and adoration and worship to you. Bless us as we come round your table. And help us to enjoy this foretaste of the feast to come. Help us, dear Lord, to enjoy all spiritual blessings that are available through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the beauty of your creation. Thank you for all good things we have. But Lord, complete our joy now. Help us to meet with Jesus. Help us to be blessed and transformed by him. And we pray it in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're going to prepare our hearts for the communion table now as we sing, uh, Be still my soul, for Christ is near. The great high priest is with you now. The Lord of life himself is near before whose face the angels bow. <laughs> chapter 19. A lovely picture of the joy of heaven. 
So the a great apostate city that has risen up against God and his people, that has persecuted his, uh, uh, his people, has been destroyed. That's what the book of Revelation has been leading up to, to so far. And then in chapter 19, it said, After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He condemned the great prostitute who had corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then the voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder shouting, Alleluia! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given for her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the words of the true God. Wonderfully comforting words there. Just a brief, glorious picture of the joy of heaven. We live in a corrupt world. We see, live in a corrupt society. We see that corruption destroying all around us, destroying all that is sacred and holy, profaning all that is noble and decent, defiling all innocence and all that is precious. But Jesus wins the victory. We may just be discouraged, but one day... This world will be judged and Jesus is returning. This is our hope and our joy. And one of the things that will sustain us through that difficult trial as we live through this world is this. This is our place of refreshing. These are those pools of refreshing on our pilgrimage towards that heavenly land. Jesus delights to meet with us around this table. When, uh, in a minute I'll be reading from those familiar words and it says, uh, um, do this until he comes. One day Jesus is returning for his people. And we do this as a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is your invitation, this is my invitation. This is effectively our wedding invitation. This is an assurance that one day Jesus will have us. We will be his perfected bride and we will be with him forever and we will be part of that great multitude that sounded like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder. Have you ever been to a really big Christian con um, uh, uh, conference where there's hundreds of people, maybe even large numbers of people, and you've uh, experienced the joy of singing in such a huge congregation of people and then maybe you've recited the Lord's, uh, the Lord's Prayer together or maybe you've said hallelujah together and you've just he heard that overwhelming rush of the, of the sound of great waters crashing it's this, the sheer volume of so many people There's something gloriously powerful about that Sometimes on a good Sunday morning, we might get a little foretaste of that. People are really excited. We lift up our voices. But really, it's only nothing compared to the reality that's ahead of us. So we have plenty to look forward to. And so we come to this table again to be refreshed, to be challenged and changed. We come, in the words of that song, to draw near to Christ, our great high priest knows and loves us. He's interceding for us now in heaven and he will complete that good work that he has already begun in your heart and in mine. Let's pray. Lord, 
Lord, we remember those words, those challenging words, that uh, you make us ready, and you give us fine and uh, fine linen, bright and clean, given for us to wear. And we know, dear Lord, that that is first and foremost your righteousness, your precious gift of righteousness, the garments of salvation that cover our nakedness and shame. But Lord, you also say that that fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. We need to be contributing towards what you have already uh, completed in us. We need to be a living reflection. And we fall short of that high standard. And we need your forgiveness. We humble ourselves again. And we remember that if it was only dependent on our righteous acts, we would be lost. And so we thank you, dear Lord, that those precious linen garments of our righteous acts have been cleansed by your precious blood. And through you, Lord Jesus Christ, we are made acceptable. We confess to you, dear Lord, that we have sinned. We have done bad things that we shouldn't have done. We know that there were good things that we ought to have done and we didn't do it. Either because we were too lazy or too busy or too distracted by other good things that needed to be done. But we, we were like Mary and Martha and we just got the priorities wrong. Worse still, Lord, are all the sins that we've committed that we're completely unaware of. But you know. And so, Lord, we humble ourselves and ask your, for your forgiveness again. Wash us, cleanse us, renew us, challenge us, change us, and give us hope through Jesus. Wash us afresh with your precious blood as we come to this, your table. Have us to eat and drink, rejoicing in your great, great love for us. And we pray to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Paul writes, for what I received from the Lord is what I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, in obedience to your example and your command, we break this bread. And we long, dear Lord, to feast on that heavenly manna that is only you can supply. In that mysterious way, dear Lord, we accept this bread. We look beyond this bread. We look for that glorified body of yours. And through this, dear Lord, may we feast on what you have made available. We thank you for our great high priest who always lives to intercede for us. We thank you, dear Lord, that you present that body to your heavenly Father. You present your wounds and your feet and your hands and your side. And you say, it was for you, my dear children, that I die. Help us, dear Lord, with grateful hearts to accept this, to trust in this. And feed us, dear Lord, with what you have promised. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Gluten allergy, we do have some gluten free bread here, but um, um, all who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ are welcome to eat from his table.
In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We'll distribute the cups, we'll pause, we'll hold on to them together, we'll drink together, but just before then, I'll pray. Lord Jesus, our souls long for refreshing. The physical heat of this day reminds us, dear Lord, of the thirst of our souls. As we, as we go through the valley of Baca, Lord, our, our hearts thirst for you. And so, Lord, refresh us. Bless us as we drink of this cup. Give us that delight of knowing that your blood has made us acceptable before a holy God, and that we're loved and accepted. Bless this God. To your glory. Amen. Continue to pray. Lord, we want to lift up to you all that are struggling at the moment. We pray for your blessing on Marlene over in Denmark and for the two children. Lord, thank you for the new accommodation, temporary accommodation that they have over there at the moment. Thank you, dear Lord, that they have prospects of finding somewhere uh, that is a nice big flat that would suit them well, that would be well located, that could be close to shops and everything else. Lord, please provide for them. We pray for Marlene's sister Angela. We pray for ongoing healing for, for her. 
We thank you that there was a small measure of good news, that things weren't quite as severe as initially thought, but there's still a lot of healing as well that she needs. May she know that she has been prayed for. Soften her heart, dear Lord, and draw her heart to Jesus. I pray that you would help Marley to find a good church, a really good church, somewhere where they will thrive and be blessed, where the children will be loved and supported, we pray for Damien as he um, is a, a, apart from them. We pray, dear Lord, that you would be able to tidy things up here, that the house sale would completely go through, that all of the problems would be dealt with. Bless him and help him. Lord, we want to pray for those that are struggling in their health. I pray for my, my vow. I just pray that you bless her on Tuesday, that everything would go smoothly. Have mercy on her, dear Lord. Lord, we want to lift up to you all the, uh, all the others that are struggling with long-term illness or sickness or going, undergoing treatment, who are struggling with old age, with aches and pains. Have mercy on them. Bless them, heal them, strengthen them. Draw their hearts close to Jesus. Lord, again we ask you for mercy for this nation. We have gone so far from you, and we need your mercy and grace. We deserve your judgment, but Lord, you are a merciful God. I pray, dear Lord, as the madness spreads, more and more people would be driven to sanity in Christ instead. They would recognize that we can't stand against this uh, on our own opinions. We need to band together under the authority of Christ. And so, Lord, please overcome the plots of the devils and the evil one, overcome all of the wickedness of this world by bringing people under the authority of Christ. Have mercy on us, dear Lord. Continue to pray for peace in Ukraine and elsewhere in the world, dear Lord. Please, please have mercy. Please bring peace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing two songs now. Uh, Shall We Gather at the River, which I don't think we've sung here before, but I'm sure some of you already know. Um, and uh, then we're going to follow that by soon and very soon we're going to see the king. I was looking around uh, for, uh, for hymns that were specifically about heaven. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, hymns about Jesus, and rightly so. But I think it's also for, for us to, uh, to remember the context in which Jesus lives. And so this is a, a wonderful old Sankey hymn. Hopefully you'll recognize it. Hopefully we'll be able to sing along to it. But it's a wonderful uh, encouragement for us all to commit to gathering by that glorious river, that symbol of death passing over into the promised land, passing over into heaven. So will you stand and sing this with me as best as you can? It's easy tune. I'm sure you'll pick it up very quickly.
One more? See you very soon. We're going to see the game. writing this letter, and it may well be one of the uh, uh, last things he ever wrote. He seems to be approaching the end of his life. He wants to sum up all that he's learned in his life of service as a, a minister of the gospel. He's trying to hand that on to Timothy so that Timothy can hand that on to others who will in turn be able to teach others. And here we are, about 2,000 years later, having inherited that wonderful, rich blessing handed through the generations. But Paul, as, as he reflects on the life that he's lived, he writes, For I am ready, I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but on all who have longed for his appearance. His appearing. This is God's word to us this evening. And they're profoundly encouraging words. So I suspect if you're the type of person that likes underlining things in your Bible, this is probably one of the uh, verses that you'd underline in your Bible. I certainly have it underli uh, underlined in several of my Bibles at home. They're wonderfully encouraging words. 
because they help us to put our own lives in context. This life is full of many, many blessings. And as we've been uh, reading, uh, I think in 1 Timothy, uh, that God is a good and generous God and he gives us good things that we may enjoy them. And gives us many, many blessings. He gives us our families and our homes. He gives us our, our gardens and our hobbies. And all of these other things are the acts of a loving God who wants us to be blessed by the good things. But he doesn't want good things to become ultimate things. And that's the problem. That's where idolatry comes in. Idolatry is basically when we take the good things that God gives to us and we make them ultimate things. Where they become so important in our thought, in our thinking, in our lives, that they start to displace the important place that God ought to have at the center of our lives. But Paul, Paul avoided that temptation. Paul was determined to live a life focused on the most important thing of all. Can I be morbid for a moment? I don't, I don't want to depress you. I just want to remind you of a reality. We're all going to die. This life is short and eternity is long. And whether we die uh, in the next six months or in the next ten years, in the next fifty years or longer, all of that time is short in comparison to eternity. There's a saying that nobody ever lies on their deathbed thinking to themselves, oh, if only I'd managed to get my power in golf a little bit lower. It, I would have lived a life that was well worthwhile. If only I'd managed to see that Spurs match that I missed. If only I had managed to, to knit something even more beautiful. If only I'd managed to grow a larger vegetable. <laughs> Whatever it is. It all seems futile in comparison to eternity. But Paul, Paul was able to look back at his life. And he says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. He was willing to pour out the whole of his life for the service of God. In the Old Testament, uh, there was one of the many, many different offerings was a drink offering to the Lord. And, of course, in a hot country like uh, um, ancient Palestine, the uh, ancient Canaan, uh, to water was something precious. And to pour out water as an offering to the Lord was saying, I'm willing to sacrifice something that is uh, uh, intended for my blessing, and I'm willing to devote it to you, dear Lord, because you're more important than I am. And he saw the whole of his life like that. Now, thankfully, God doesn't call all of us to be martyrs. Thankfully, the vast majority of Christians in this country certainly were, are, are, are very unlikely to be asked to lay down our lives as martyrs, to be killed for the faith. We are wonderfully, wonderfully blessed in all sorts of different ways. And yet sometimes that blessing can actually be a profound discouragement in comparison to our eternity. Sometimes those good things can start to replace the ultimate good thing of God himself. And so God challenges us to make sure that we have our priorities right. To pour out our lives to him. To make sure that Jesus has his appropriate place in our lives. And yes, we can enjoy those other good things. Yes, we can be grateful for the fun that we have, for the good things that God gives us. But we come together. And week by week, we gather and we say, thank you, God, communally and individually. Throughout the rest of the week, we say, thank you, Lord, that you are at the center of our lives. You are precious. You are important. And we bring back to you only the good things that you first gave to us. Paul had a clean conscience. And therefore, it wasn't a morbid thing for him to talk about death. I suspect that one of the reasons that our culture often doesn't like talking about death and says, oh, that's just morbid, that's depressing, is because comparatively few people seem to have a clean conscience. Did I live my life with my priorities right? Did I live a life where... I can say to Jesus, I may have been sinned against you, I may have been imperfect, but Lord Jesus, 
I kept coming back to you. I kept finding forgiveness in you. And you continued to give me strength. You continued to have mercy and you continued to help me to get my priorities right. And if we live a life like that, our own deaths will be so much easier to cope with. We have, as Christians, that guarantee that we will be with Jesus forever. Thou, thou are very, very excited about being with Jesus. You can see her, she just glows with the excitement of being with Jesus forever. She can't imagine anything better than that. It's a wonderful encouragement for me to hear that. But she doesn't like that, look forward to dying. None of us would. Dying's a horrible, horrible, tragic enemy. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That process of dying is troubling. And it's troubling for Christians just as it, as it can be for non-Christians. But it's so much more distressing with an uneasy conscience. And it's so much more of a comfort to be able to look back on a life and say, Lord, my life is yours. I've lived it with the strength that you gave me. Again, another wonderful blessing that we have in some ways could be a bit of a trial which is our great long lives that we, uh, most of us can enjoy. And I know again, from speaking to many people in this church who have served in this church and in other churches very, very faithfully for decade after decade after decade, that the last five years of life can sometimes be troubling because of the old age, because of uh, aches and pains, because of hospital commitments, because of failing eyesight and failing hearing and all sorts of other troubles there's that inability to serve as once we could serve. But again, we leave that with God. It may well be that this will be true of some of us. We'll have those, uh, those frustrating last few years of life where we're housebound, where we can't get out quite as much, where we don't have the energy that you once did, where we fall asleep at inappropriate times and all of those other frustrations and humiliations of old age. But at the same time, we can only say before God, Lord, I've lived my life out within the limits that you have given me. And even these limitations of my old age are appointed by you, and I trust in you. I don't beat myself up, I don't make myself feel ashamed. Lord, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I entrust my life to you. You are my rock, you are my comfort, and Thank you, Lord, that my performance before you, my reward before you, isn't entirely based on what I have done. It's based on what Jesus has done for me. And so even then, even then there's that lovely thing of visiting an elderly Christian saint. And seeing the peace that they have, and even though they may express frustrations, not being able to come to church or not being able to do the things that they once did, there's that peace. Because they too can say with Paul, the time has come for my departure. I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And that's the ultimate source of comfort as each and every one of us will inevitably face at the end of our lives. I hope and pray that you long to have that peace of conscience and that you'll live your life according to that. Because the alternative is to live for the temporary pleasures of this world. To allow those secondary things to become the centre and for Jesus to become displaced. And then to lose that sense of confidence on our death. But, but beyond that, beyond that clean conscience that we all should long to have towards the end of our lives, is something even better. Now there is in store for me that crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but all who have longed for his appearing, we have the hope. Sorry to disappoint, but he um, heaven itself is only temporary. One day Jesus is returning. 
And he will bring with us all of his people and there will be new heavens and a new earth and we'll be resurrected and reunited to new bodies. But heaven will be great. Heaven will be glorious because we will be with Jesus. Paul talks about being absent from the body and present with the Lord forever. And yes, one day we'll be reunited to our resurrected bodies. One day we will be separated from these physical, physically imperfect bodies. One day all of the suffering and aches and pains and frustrations of failing eyesight and failing hearing and falling out hair and all of the other problems that we face will be left behind. And even better... Those sinful inclinations, those laziness, that excuse making, that blame giving, all of those other temporary frustrations that we face, all of those self pitying and everything else, all that makes us less like Christ will be left behind. And we'll be free, free at last to be like Jesus. To love and enjoy Him forever. To be in His presence, to gaze on His holiness, to take delight in who He is encourage you to read through Revelation. You may not understand it all, but the really important parts you will understand. Those glorious pictures of heaven, those glorious foresights of what it is that the saints do in glory as they give God the glory, as they delight in who he is, as they worship and bow down before him, as they're utterly overwhelmed in delight and excitement at being with Jesus. We can speculate about how much they know about what's going on on earth and how much they intercede for us and how much they continue that work of prayer that we begin in this life and we can, uh, we can uh, speculate about whether we'll see our pets and all of sorts of other different things. I'm more than excited to find out all of these things. I don't know one thing. You'll be with Jesus. And that will be enough. And everything else that we will have beyond that will be a glorious gift. Even more enjoyable, even more glorious, even more exciting because of Jesus at the center. He will be that enormous sun at the center of our solar system. And everything else that will be have will be just be like a little planet spinning round and round his great glory. He's the one whose gravity can hold us in his presence. He's the source of light and hope that brings us meaning. And that will be our ultimate reward. But it does say, the righteous judge who will award me on that day. There's different, differing rewards. And again, we're reminded of that throughout the New Testament. And again, I, get, I can't fully explain exactly what that means. But I do take it and I, as, for myself as a challenge to work harder for the kingdom. To keep striving forward to receive that glorious crown. I don't know if that's a literal crown. I don't know if that's a symbolic crown. And in one sense, I don't really care because it will be fantastic. I want to see that. And I know that there will be countless other millions of people that will receive more, greater rewards, bigger crowns, more crowns, whatever it is. And that will be my delight to see them rewarded. And I know that maybe there'll be other people that will receive a smaller crown. And I'll be delighted that they're with them. And there'll be no bitterness or jealous or envy or anything else. There will be a delight and a contentment in the goodness of God. Oh, but I want to please my Savior. I want to see that smile on his face. And I hope and pray that you do too. I hope and pray that you want to see your Savior. Say, well done, good and faithful servant. And this, this motivation, this is why we work forward. This is why we continue to, uh, to meet together. This is why we serve in the church. One of the many, many reasons there's the delight of just serving one another and seeing the blessings that it brings to our fellow Christians. We use the gifts that we have. We see other people growing in their faith. We see them raising up in worship and adoration. We see them growing in their knowledge and commitment and receiving comfort and we're involved in all of that. And that's a reward in itself. But beyond that, beyond that is the smile of Jesus, which is infinitely more precious. We strive on to receive more and more of that. And so, how about applying this to yourself? 
How about putting your name here? For I, Rory, have been poured out like a drink offering. I, Martin, I, Malcolm, I put your name here. I am being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only for me, but for all who have longed for his appearance. Do you feel the challenge of that? Do you feel the excitement, the hope that lies within that? Stay focused on that. Accept the trials, accept the limitations, accept the frustrations, accept the, the glorious blessings and privileges. All of those things are part of it. Stay focused on that. Look to the goal. Aim there. So precious, the end of your life. Hold on to that good, clean conscience before God, and then to have that deep, deep assurance that we will be with Jesus forever. Let's pray. Mm. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. Thank you, dear Lord. Lord, we sometimes feel ourselves weak. There's been times in each of our lives, dear Lord, where we haven't fought the good fight. We haven't kept the faith. We've allowed other things to displace where you ought to be. But we thank you that you're a gracious God. Fill our hearts with a deeper commitment to you. Help us, dear Lord, to be excited about that final end to our lives. Help us to, to not fear death and be morbid about it, but rather to earnestly hope that we will have that good conscience that Paul himself had. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And to conclude our worship this evening with in heavenly love abide.
Amen. Amen. Let's say the grace to one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.